I think openness can give if you're willing to give it. I think a lot of people may benefit from other people's openness without ever doing anything first. And that's okay because a lot of open stuff is there for anyone to use without reciprocity. But if you reciprocate and if you maintain relationships and you invest in building them, you're going to get so much more out of it because people will find you and get you things you didn't even know you needed because they know you're interested in them. Hello and welcome to Inspiring Open, candid conversations with influential women whose careers and open ethos have pushed the boundaries of what it means to build community and succeed as a collective. I am Betty Kankambwedu, a journalist and women's rights advocate. Join me as I explore the fascinating backstories behind Africa's most tenacious female personalities. Inspiring Open is a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women a project of Wiki in Africa. Be inspired, be challenged, be bold. On Inspiring Open today is Maha Bali. Maha comes from a family of medical doctors but fancied studying computer science. This was not to last, however, as it didn't gel with her personality as an extrovert. She then made the happy option of becoming an educator. She is currently an associate professor of practice at the Center for Learning and Teaching at the American University in Cairo. Maha's love of interacting and connecting with people led her to co-found Virtually Connecting, a grassroots movement that challenges academic gatekeeping at conferences. She's also the co-facilitator of Equity Unbound, an equity-focused, open, connected intercultural learning curriculum. Welcome to Inspiring Open Maha. Let's dive right into the conversation. Let me welcome you once again to the Inspiring Open podcast. And thank you so much for making time to to join us. Thank you so much for having me. All right. I saw the cute baby on your WhatsApp. Is that your last baby? Yeah, I only have one. Ah. Uh, She is now 10 years old. In that photo, she was probably maybe one and a half or two years old. Oh, okay. Okay. You mentioned somewhere that you use the toys and um, tools your daughter plays with in, you know, your teaching and your workshops. And I thought that was so cool and interesting. Having a child and watching them learn inspires me so much for my teaching. And it's also one of the reasons I'm open. Uh-huh. And I'll, I'll talk about this as we go along. As we go but along. But I'm also remembering as I was finishing my PhD, I remember reading an article um, by a female scholar talking about how empowering was for her to bring in her motherhood into her pedagogy. Mm. And ever since I read that, I don't even remember who said it, (laughs) but I remember reading that. And ever since then, I bring her into, I mean, I have a lot of articles or blog posts, at least where I talk about it, but also she is a lot of the reason uh, why, or just being a parent in this culture that I'm in sort of encourages me to be more open. Let's just delve into your background a little bit. You grew up in Egypt. Can you no, tell me? I didn't. You didn't. I didn't. What? No. Tell me about that. I was, I was, I was born in Kuwait. Okay. Um, and I was there up until 1990. This mm. is actually an important story because I was in a very good British school in Kuwait. And then mm-hmm. 1990, there was the invasion of Iraq and Kuwait. So we had to come back to Egypt because I'm originally from Egypt. My mm. parents are from here. Um, and so I had to go to a school here and the education system was so completely different that I remember I was 11 years old at the time. And I said, I want to improve education. in Egypt is so bad. Um, and I had to stay here for like three years. And then I went back to Kuwait where I did my high school GCSEs and A-levels. And then I came back to Egypt, um, to the American University in Cairo for a university. Mm. So I didn't actually grow up here. Ah, so how was growing up like in Kuwait then? Why did your parents move to Kuwait? Did they move for work? Yeah, like, wow. yeah, they moved for work. Both of my parents are medical doctors and they moved to Kuwait for work. Um, and growing up in Kuwait was multicultural. And multinational. So Kuwait is one of those countries in the Gulf where there are very few people from the country itself. Like most of the population are expats. So I grew up and around me, not only a lot of Egyptians, but also a lot of Arabs from different nationalities and then people from all over the world in school, you know. Um, so I got used to that. My, prof- my teachers were all English or Australian or Irish, things like that. So I grew up with that. Um, and that made a difference because that growing up, seeing that kind of diversity, Diversity is very different than being exposed to it when you're older and adapting to it. Yeah, that's right. And then when you came back to Egypt, 
you had to you, you had to adapt i guess yeah i mean first of all you it's it's an identity crisis because you're a third culture person you're officially Egyptian, but you were born somewhere else that doesn't give you that nationality. Um, and you're used to being in a certain environment and a very westernized education system. And then I came here and they were supposed to speak English, but they didn't speak good English. And they made fun of me because my English was good, which yeah. is confusing. And I spoke Arabic, but my way of speaking Arabic was different than their way of speaking Arabic. And the education system was strange. And the way people made friendships was strange. And of course, it was a traumatizing time. Like when my daughter was going through the first isolation of COVID and saying, you've never experienced that. I'm like, yes, I've never experienced COVID, of course. But I did experience trauma when I was at age 11 of suddenly not having my home and my friends and my school and everything. And just that shift in itself uh, was really difficult. Um, but ho thankfully, I, I wasn't poor. We had a home here. We had family here that welcomed us. But it's still a big shift for someone at that age. And it's that, yeah, like you're going through puberty and you're becoming a teenager. So you're mm. moody anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so having to make new friends completely with people who seem so culturally different, I kept making a lot of cultural misunderstandings. And nobody expects that because you look Egyptian, you are Egyptian. How could you not understand our jokes? How could yeah. you not understand our way of being? But over time, I sort of got, got used to it a little bit. And then mm. towards the end, the one friend that I got closest to in that mm. three-year period was someone who also grew up in Kuwait. Ah. Uh, but she was from the Sudan, so she okay. wasn't Egyptian. Okay. But she had grown up in Kuwait. Um, and so, and we both did our master's in the UK So later. Um, so that was really, and we're still in touch right now. So it's interesting, like even a lot of times, and even when I went to university again at the American University in Cairo, a lot of my friends were people who had grown up in similar parts of the world, so Kuwait, mm. Dubai, Saudi Arabia, like they had that kind of culture. Yeah. But then I also branched out into, well, no, wait a minute. I don't have to only have friends who are like me. I also <laughs> want to know other people. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I lived in Egypt for a while, did my undergraduate studies here and work started. I was originally a computer scientist, which I actually didn't like very much. Both your parents are doctors, right? Yeah, and my husband and his mom and his sister <laughs> and half of my family. Oh, I, there wasn't any pressure to also follow that path? It was the opposite. I, I, I grew up and my parents didn't want me to go through that because of the way medical education in Egypt is frustrating. Uh, I'm probably in a lot of spaces in the developing, you know, global south and so on. Is this a lot of you know, medical healthcare is not well resourced and well organized. And they lived in Kuwait where they saw it done really well and they mm. were frustrated by coming here. So they don't want me to get frustrated with that. But uh, so they raised me not to want to become a doctor. But towards the end, I started to get interested in medicine. I was like, hey, you know what? I might want to try it. And so what they said is go to the American University in Cairo. It's a similar cultural environment to your education in Kuwait and try it. And if you don't like it, move to medical education. And it actually pulled me in uh, socially. It was a nice social environment. There are a lot of them. The thing about higher education, which I think a lot of people are missing during COVID, is it's not about the classes and what you learn in the mm -hmm. classroom. It's about the social and cultural capital you develop by interacting mm -hmm. with people. Mm -hmm. And that's what kept me at the American University in Cairo more than the actual. I didn't like computer science, but I liked everything else. And I made a lot of friends and I just wanted to stay there. You know, My husband is a medical doctor. And when I first married him, he was going through the hell of exams for his doctorate now i understand why my parents don't want me to go through that <laughs> because it's it's torture they, it's torture i don't know why they do that it's oppressive when you say it's torture like can you give me some yeah. details like what do what yeah what do you yeah mean? so so there's two there's two elements of why it's torture one is related to education and corruption mm. in education and one is related to actual medical care and healthcare system mm. corruption in education is they make it really difficult to get a doctorate by making you do the exam and failing and making do, do the exam and failing all the time and i don't understand why they have to do that to people uh and it's that really, sounds deliberate of, it is deliberate it's yeah there's a lot of nepotism like who's your father and who do you mm. know and things like that that are really really frustrating um and so i saw that happen to my husband and the effect it had on him and he was always saying i hope that when i'm in power i don't do that to other people yeah. like they would do some really mean things to them in the oral exams and like, why do you have to do that to a person, you know? Yeah. And then the other element that's really frustrating is my husband's a vascular surgeon. And he had the opportunity to do a one-year fellowship in the U.S. and an almost one-year fellowship in the U.K. And he would come back home and say, oh, my God, I see people here who live until age 90. Mm -hmm. And in Egypt, because the 
the healthcare system doesn't help, they don't survive past 40 or 50. Mm -hmm. And it's not because the doctors aren't good. It's because the whole system doesn't work for the good of the patients. So that is really sad to experience, to know that, oh, my God, I could have saved that person's life and you, you can't because of all these circumstances. Just, yeah. And so... That, that, and, you know, when you become a doctor and you really care to save people's lives and to heal them, and then you know that you're not doing the best you can because you don't have the resources, it's hard. Yeah, that's right. I can imagine. So now you studied computer science. You're from a mm -hmm. family of physicians. What drew you to computer science? Yeah, so this was a really silly process of elimination. I looked at all the things in the university that were available that mm. made sense to me that I might be interested in. And I'm like, oh, engineering, not that good at physics, even though I had to do a lot of physics for computer science, but never mind. <laughs> uh, I like math. So, mm. OK, that's good. That's computer science. And then I was considering business. So I, at first I declared both business and computer science. And then when I studied business for a while, I had already done advanced level business in school and I did business as a minor. I'm like, I'm not really learning much. I already this is in intuitive to me. Mm. I don't need to study it to be able to do it. But computer science was harder. For, it was challenging. It was something I didn't know. I used to be like afraid of computers. Like if, if my computer didn't work, I would turn it off and go pray and come back. <laughs> and of course, I didn't know at the time that it was the restart that was working, probably not the prayers. I mean, just restarting <laughs> usually works. That's After four and a half years of studying computer science, I know that it's the restart that fixes everything. Did the computer come on every time you went to pray? <laughs> usually. Usually that was all the problem that was. Um, but I didn't like computer science for a couple of reasons. First of all, it wasn't a very social major. I made a lot of friends, but the, the crux of it is you work on your own. That doesn't even make sense to me now. I don't know what your background is, but of course, when you're a computer science, you have to work with the person who's that you're working, that you're developing a program for. Yes. You need to understand accounting to help the accountants. You need to understand the doctor to create a medical system. But actually, most computer scientists don't make a lot of effort to do that. And that's mm. why a lot of educational software is not good, because it's a computer scientist imagining what education should be <laughs> and doing it for us. But that's not actually what the teachers want. And then the administrators convincing the teachers that this is good for you and it's good for efficiency. But it's not good for pedagogy. So the, the lack of sociality in it, I'm a very socio-emotional, very extroverted person. And so my most of my university experience was, let's get done with the computer stuff so I can do the extracurricular stuff. Mm. In my last year of computer science, my our thesis was about using neural networks. This is like machine learning now, like a kind of machine learning, right? Um, which, you know, simulates the way the brain learns. And I was like, oh my God, that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in how the brain learns. I'm interested yeah. in psychology and neurology and cognitive neuroscience. And I took a psychology class. And then I was like, oh, hey, this is actually what I want to do <laughs> in my last year. Uh, and so after I graduated, I worked in, in IT at uh, Procter & Gamble. That's a very big multinational. And it's a very good place to work and very nice environment and everything. But after a while, people who were older than me mentoring me said, you know what? I think you're more interested in giving training than doing the actual work and helping people. And you're interested in, the, again, the social aspects. And I realized, oh, I like psychology. I like teaching. I already, when I was 11 years old, wanted to work in education. And so I took this one educational psychology class and then I switched careers and went to work where I work now um, and did my master's. And at the time, it was a master's of education in e-learning. And then I did a PhD in education afterwards. Oh, interesting. My, my background, actually, um, no computers in my background. <laughs> like, Good no for computers. you. <laughs> no computers in my background. But um, I've worked with people who work with computers a lot. And in one of my, my jobs five years ago, there was this particular developer that we worked with. And I thought his people skills was not the best. And the explanation I got was those of us who work with computers, we like to be in our corner. We like to be very um, um, secluded. And like he said, when you're building a system that people would have to work with, it's very, very important that you interact with the people who work with the system. So, yeah, I thought that was um, interesting. And I thought that was a little bit weird then. And that's a stereotype, of course, but it is one a stereotype that is based on reality. I mean, I originally went into e-learning, then I became pure education. Then I went back to digital education because that was my what my university needed. I forgot to tell you the other reason I left computer science. It's a gender issue. I assume this is pretty worldwide with STEM fields in general. I was just telling some of my friends uh, the other day. So I was one of the best people in my class. But people always assumed that the boys knew better. Ah. If there was ever a, a problem, they would ask the boys. 
even my father, who was a very, very supportive father and generally not sexist at all, always believed that he knew how to fix the computer better than I could. Uh, my husband and his cousin, who are both doctors, always think they can fix the computer better than me. And, and, and I faced this in my work. If a man needed help with something, they would go talk to my male colleague sitting right next to me, even though it was actually my job. And my male colleague would just do it. He wouldn't say this is actually Maha's work. No matter what you do, you're still perceived as less. So, so you had to leave. You're like, oh, I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. And, and it wasn't that much fun either. I wanted mm -hmm. to be with people and I wanted to focus on people. And education was much more worthwhile than doing IT for a company that sells shampoo, you know. You mentioned that when you were 11 years, you always wanted to be an educator. Like, where did that come from? Like, did you experience something? Did you see something? It was the experience of seeing Egyptian education versus the high quality education I was receiving in Kuwait. I realize now that British education in Britain is not of the same quality as what I, what I experienced there. Mm -hmm. I experienced a good quality British education. It was private. My parents were expats. Everyone with me in school were expats. So they, you know, they got good teachers and a good system and so on. Coming to Egypt, it was more of a mainstream, semi-private type of education. Um, but using the public curriculum, which was really, really poorly designed, it was very memorization based, uh, pretty useless. I had never been asked to memorize anything in my life. And here I was memorizing these useless, useless facts. You would learn the population numbers, a lot of different Arab and African countries. Like why? This number changes all the time. You can maybe learn that this country is more populous than the other country. Yeah. <laughs> why do I need to learn the number? Um, and then with history... They would spend an entire year teaching us about maybe ancient Egyptian history. And then with modern Egyptian history, the three most important dates in modern Egyptian history were on one page. One wow. page. The three most important events in, Egyptian, in recent Egyptian history. And I, uh, they, they, I don't know how they decided what to emphasize. Maybe it was for political reasons that they mm. didn't want to get into these things. Uh, but it felt very problematic. And... Um, yeah, it was just a really bad curriculum. And then um, the way they taught language, the way they taught mm -hmm. English, uh, and and they also have that problem with teaching Arabic, is they teach it in a very functional, not a communicative way. So okay. you learn the grammar rules and so on, but you don't act, and the meanings of words and their opposites, and their, but how do I use the language to communicate? Yeah. It wasn't yeah. being taught. And so people get out of school. And supposedly they tick a box of, I know this language and I did well on the exam, but then ask them to actually write something or to actually do something with it. And they can. Yeah. It's not different from, from my experience here as well. You know, English is also taught in a very functional way. Like you're saying, not um, in a very communicative way. So sometimes it's hard to, for a lot of people, and you know, it's hard for us to express ourselves in English. And it's even harder when we have to like write so, yeah, and English is the official language here. So I, I get what you're saying. Let's talk about your people skills, because you mentioned a lot that you are an extrovert. Yeah. Like, how, how did that start? Would you, would you say that it was like the, the environment in Kuwait in school? You know, you said there were a lot of mm. different people, different cultures, different backgrounds. Would you think that that's why you picked it up or it's just how your parents raised you? It's a very interesting question. Uh, I don't know how much of this is the way you're born and how much it's, you know, that question of nature mm -hmm. nurture, right? How much is um, parenting? I'll say one thing. The, the environment in Kuwait was safe. It was easy at a young age for me to go out and play with people. My parents didn't have to worry about where I would go, what I would do. Whereas in Egypt, it was a, bit, a little bit less safe in the sense of the openness. Like you have to be very careful where you let your child play and things like that. Um, not that huge of a difference, but it still made a difference at the time uh, at a very young age. Um, definitely the exposure to diversity made it easier to deal with diversity. But then when I came to Egypt when I was 11, I was struggling with the lack of diversity. So that's an interesting thing. Or, or you don't realize that someone might appear to be the same as you but aren't. So you, you're surprised every time. And they're surprised because they're not used to that. And then it becomes a whole cycle of that until everybody adapts to it. Um, definitely there were stages, uh, I, I like reading a lot. And so for my family, if I, if I'm sitting with my cousins and I want to actually sit and read, that was an introverted behavior in their view. Mm -hmm. Whereas for me, I'm like, no, I'm reading an interesting book and I just want to finish it. <laughs> you know, there was a time when I'd be sitting and reading and reading and reading. And my mom would be like, I'm going out. Do you want to come with me? I'm going out. Do you want to come with me? And I didn't want to. 
But at some point I started to, okay, I'm not going to upset my mom. I'm going to start going out. And then I started to realize that I actually like going out. I mean, there are small phases of my life where I wasn't very uh, extroverted, but um, I think I did sort of get better at it. As I got older, one of the Mm -hmm. things, for example, at university is I had a lot of my school friends with me in university. A lot of people would just then stick to those friends, but I didn't. I wanted to get to know a lot of different people and join different organizations. So maybe I wasn't at the time the kind of person who'd walk up to anyone to get to know them, but I would join an extracurricular activity Mm -hmm. where I could get to know people within a certain structure or framework. Right now, I'm not like that at all. I'm I'm just, I'm really, really extroverted. (laughs) Like I'll go up to... (laughs) But it's easier online too, because mm. online, if someone like doesn't answer you, it's not a problem. Yeah. If they give you a rude answer, you can just brush it off. In person, if you actually walk up to a person and they brush you off, it's really, really embarrassing. I'll take it, but it's it doesn't feel good, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, how many siblings do you have? I don't have any. Ah, you're an only child. Yeah. Is that fun being an only child? Uh, When I was younger, I had my imaginary friends and I had lots of brothers and sisters in my imagination. Uh And I was also really close to my friends and my cousins. I had cousins with us in Kuwait as well. So I was very close to them. And when we came to Egypt, some of them lived in the same building with us. Mm -hmm. So that was really cool. So they were like my little brothers and sisters. Uh, After a certain age, like around age 10, I was like, I don't want any brothers or sisters. I like this attention. (laughs) I think the moment I felt bad about it is when my father passed away. Oh. And I was pregnant. So realizing that my mom and I were now alone, there was nobody else to take care of us but ourselves. Mm. And um, I had a lot of trouble getting pregnant in the first place. So mm. at the time, I was like, I would like to have more than one child so that my daughter doesn't have to live through this. Yeah. Um, but I actually had a really traumatic time when I was pregnant. So I really don't want to get pregnant again because my mm. father passed away when I was pregnant. I had all sorts of other issues. Um, and so... For now, my daughter's happy being on her own. I can just focus with her because, yeah, I'm just worried about getting another child and not being able to handle it. Do what's best for you. I think that's that's what's most important, what is best for you. And yeah. then growing up with your parents, what principle do you think they insisted on that has held you as an adult? Um, I'm going to say one of the things that I always remember about my mom um, this is actually quite related to openness. She said, if you're doing something right, if you're doing something that isn't wrong, then you should be willing to share it with anyone. If you find yourself yeah. not able to share something, then you're probably doing something wrong. This concept has influenced me a lot. And it also has influenced my view about academic integrity. A lot of this idea of uh, let's use a plagiarism detection software or let's use uh, something to watch the students, mm-hmm. proctor them while they're doing an exam. This is not promoting that value of integrity coming from you from inside you. It's promoting the value of oh, somebody is surveilling you. So you should not cheat because someone's watching you, not because it's the wrong thing to do. The other value that my mom gave me, which is also really interesting, is about being proud of your own identity. Um, when I was very young. I had a lot of friends with different Arabic dialects, as I told you. And I would meet a friend, come back and speak in a Palestinian accent. Meet another friend, come back and speak in a Sudanese accent. And my mom was like, wait a minute, you're Egyptian. You don't need to change your accent every time. You don't need to color yourself by the mm. way other people speak. Just be yourself. Uh, and even though I can speak all these different accents if I wanted to, I just learned that I don't have to change my accent every time I talk to someone. So I think that was more than what it sounds like. It sounds like a technical thing. It's just mm. an accent, but it's more than that. It's about being, you know, being who you are and not feeling like you need to change depending on who you're with. I think that's important too. It, my my first big boss at my current work at the American University in Cairo used to tell me that I have a lot of confidence and she thinks my mom taught that to me. I I don't know for sure if that's the case. I definitely know that when I was younger, I was overconfident. I Mm. thought I knew better. You know, I'd been studying education for two years and I thought I knew everything. And then when I did my PhD, I realized that I know nothing. As I get older and learn more, I realized that I know less and less and less. And so getting that humility I started to get when I was older. And I think that, again, being open and talking about your practice and talking about your mistakes increases your humility. And it also makes you vulnerable. And then it takes some confidence and some privilege to be able to expose yourself that way and and be willing to say, I've made mistakes and I do some things wrong. And here's me trying to figure out how to do this. How much of your personality, like being extroverted, how much has it impacted your work as an educator? Yeah, well, uh, I 
first of all, I, I always want to connect with my students and get to know them as individuals. I'm not there to just teach them content. I want to get to know them and I care about their lives. And they come into my classes and this semester especially, they said we made friends in the class. I care about their social life. Um, and one of the issues there is that I like a very participatory class with lots of discussion and talking and so on, but some students don't like that. And, you know, there's an element of it where you don't want to put so much pressure on someone that that is not a good class for them anymore. And on the other hand, it's an important social skill that they need to develop. So yeah. what's important for me is to create a safe environment where everyone eventually feels comfortable being part of the discussion, making sure that the it's a safe space that other students won't... Um, it's possible sometimes that students who are very confident and eloquent will make it difficult and silence the others. So it's really important for me that nobody gets silenced and there are different ways of participating and things like that. I'm also very social with teachers. My main role is actually teaching teachers. Like I give workshops and so on to the professors in the university where I teach. And again, I, I do the workshops, but I also maintain these relationships with them. So they'll tell me more than, and I'll know more about what's going on in their class than what would officially be told. That helps me support them better. And for me, it's the building community aspect um, and supporting their confidence and helping them meet their own teaching philosophy rather than giving them best practice of, oh, this is the right thing to do. So when the pandemic happened, I was one of the key people involved in helping the university move online. Um, so my boss was going to all these strategic planning meetings and coming back to me and telling me this is what the university wants to do. And I was the expert in e-learning, so I was making it work, right? Um, and a lot of the time, other than all my official work, I was just getting lots of phone calls and texts from professors telling me what they're really facing and what they're panicking about and what they're anxious about and where they need help. And this was helping us create a more responsive support system. Mm. And if you don't like people, you're never going to tolerate the amount of phone calls and texts I was getting at the time. That's so true. That's true. I'm lucky that I like them. <laughs> I'm sure they like you too. <laughs> so, <laughs> Some of them. <laughs> not all of them. <laughs> no. Definitely, yeah. Sure there I mean, are a lot of people who don't want to hear from me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I also, what happened in the pandemic also is that I had I was very strong on my care and equity values. And that's a lot of work for some people because not everyone teaches that way. And so I was very strong on the understanding of your students' circumstances, the understanding of the trauma. Uh, if they tell you the workload is too much, believe them. They're not just being uh, you know, lazy. Mm -hmm. Figure out a way to help them. Be forgiving of people who miss classes because they have circumstances, things like that, that normally I don't have the right really to tell people. But during the pandemic, I felt like I had to, you know? Yeah. You've left computer science. <laughs> yes. now you are into education and yes. Uh, yes and now you're doing what you've always wanted to do tell me about how that transition was was it easy and how that journey of going into education started when you quit computer science i don't know if it's the same for you but in egypt if you study something and then you want to switch careers people are looking at you like weird like you've spent all that time studying that and now you want to change and you work in a really good multinational company. You want to change. And so the first thing was happening was when I was working in my old work uh, at the company Procter & Gamble, I was doing a lot of extracurricular non, you know, NGO work, volunteering and doing things. I was very involved in grassroots movements, trying to do things like mentoring and some forms of education in some way or other. And I was running around trying to fill that gap with these extracurriculars. And I was like, wait a minute, why don't I just switch to that, you know? And so when I started to talk to my parents about it, and they weren't very happy, but they agreed to let me take one educational psychology course, just one course that I took like twice a week uh, at my old university, like American University in Cairo, where I graduated from. And so when I took that, the professor there is the one who helped me figure out what to do with my master's. And there was a, just a coincidence that because I was talking about it so much, my mother met someone who told her there's a new center coming to AUC Center for Learning and Teaching. And so they let my who was my boss, the person who hired me, they let her know that this, there's a person who exists who's interested. And it turns out, so I went to meet her to just see if we would be compatible. And it turns out that her sister used to be my professor. She had heard of me from her sister when she found, you know, when she told her sister my name and so on. Um, and then, yeah, and then the, there was a job opening at the center and I applied and I got in. Um, when I got in, it was the same time I wanted to start my master's. And so I found a master's online and my current boss, my boss at the time who hired me, we talked about like which there are several different options. So I, I did the one in e-learning because that was this was 2003. So this was really new, early days of e-learning. 
And it was a fully online master's. And it makes sense if you're studying e-learning to study it online, right? Mm -hmm. So nobody, at the time, people always thought e-learning was lower quality. We still kind of do sometimes. But at the time, even more so, right? There was no Zoom. There was no that. There was a little bit of Skype. I think I started to use in 2006 after I finished my master's. Mm. But when I was doing my master's, it was all asynchronous text-based. And it was a beautiful, very social experience. So I was doing my master's and my work, I was supporting people as a, like an instructional technologist. So it sort of didn't feel weird because I had the computer science background and a little bit of education that it was increasing. And I just taught myself and took a lot of free online courses before they were called MOOCs. Mm -hmm. They existed. <laughs> <laughs> and I found all these opportunities just to teach myself. And yeah, so that was how I got into education. And then when I finished my master's, I found a way to do my PhD in the UK without living there. I would go visit my supervisor once a year or something and come back. And I did my research about my university. So there was a reason to be in Egypt while I was doing it. And then when I finished my PhD, my positions were shifted a little bit and I started teach. I started teaching just before. And now I teach as well, you know, I teach students as well as the work of actually helping professors. And, and for some reason, I also do a lot of extracurricular stuff. All my open stuff is not part of my job. I'm not one of those people where we have a, an open, a big open program in my university. I introduced sort of some different things because mm -hmm. of my interest in open, but most of my open work is just outside. As an associate professor of practice at the Center for Learning and Teaching uh, at the American University in Cairo, what, what do you do? Like, what does that entail? So my work is officially like it's an educational developer. So in my context, I give workshops to professors mm -hmm. on different ways to teach. Um, I give consultations, like someone will come and say something's not working for me or I want to improve this. And I can either go into their class and observe them or we do in-class assessments. I also help with institutional assessments. Um, and uh, throughout different parts of my life, I've done more and less technology, depending on what was needed. I introduce new things into the university or I support new things. So that's that's generally what I do. And I help people if they want to do like classroom action research and things like that. And then... My exposure to different educational systems, the British, the Egyptian, and then the American University in Cairo with an American system, mm -hmm. made me understand how these systems sort of change the way you think and you develop. So when someone enters our university, they could be coming from an Egyptian background, a British school background, American school background, other school backgrounds, and therefore they don't come in the same place. They have different skills and they have different weaknesses and they need different kinds of support. And that's what I, part of what I did in my research was the development of critical thinking is different, has a different trajectory for each of these kinds of people. And if you don't take care, some of them will struggle a lot and others will breeze through it. Uh, and that influences. And also, of course, the professors who come to teach. AUC is a liberal arts institution, which is a very specific American way style of teaching. But most of the professors who teach engineering and computer science, they have a degree from a university that's just focused on that. They mm -hmm. don't know what liberal arts education means or how it should be done. And so they'll teach the way they were taught. Um, professors who were taught, uh, who got their PhDs from different places are just coming from a different culture. And it's not just you teach and you teach. No, you teach with, a cer with certain values and philosophy. And do they align with what the university expects and wants for its students? And then how well do you uh, make sure that every student is able to succeed um, in the way that you do things? I can just tell from one of your blog posts um, when you were reviewing how the semester went. And of course, it was also based on an assessment your students did of your work. And for me, what stood out was just the level of care the level of care, you know, you try to analyze every kind of assessment that you were giving, how to make it better, what, what accounted for the students coming to this conclusion. And it was so interesting, even down to ensuring that they are punctual and instead of instituting punitive measures, you were, you were concerned about what other ways you could go about that to get students to come to class on time? I thought that was so interesting. I think there's there's a very important um, um, thing expression that we use in Egypt. They don't apply it in the educational system, but it's the way they say it. And they don't just say uh, education as in learning. They say terbiya. Mm. And terbiya is about sort of raising the person. There's a German expression called Bildung, which I think is the closest thing. Mm -hmm. And to me, I interpret this as how do you um, cultivate the human being? And I think education or my role as a teacher is not to teach them the content or to teach them the skills. I mean, yes, that too. But for me, it's like, 
how do you help shape them as a human being, as a citizen? Um, how do you shape their morality and how do they sh- you shape the way they are in the world, the way they mm. be, not what they do and what they mm. say, but how mm. they are. Um, and so that's been central to my practice for a long time. It requires making yourself fairly, very vulnerable all the time and reflecting a lot and questioning yourself about what you're doing um, as you grow with your students and learn with them and learn from them. And that that particular thing that you're talking about, uh, the lateness and the punctuality and stuff is like, oh, I value punctuality, but I understand why students may have yeah. trouble with it. They're Egyptians. Yeah. Punctuality is not a thing. Yeah. Maybe it should be a thing. And are they doing it because they don't respect me? No, I'm not going to assume they don't respect me because when they're there, they seem engaged. So mm. there must be another reason why it's happening. Can we discover why? Can we help them do it better rather than punish them, which is not going to help them do it better? Like the punishment is not going to achieve the result you want. Maybe it might make you feel better, like you got your revenge, but it's not going to improve the situation. Yeah, it's not. I mean, we've we've been punished so many times <laughs> in school that I remember we learned French in school and our teacher, that, and I'm sure this will be same experience for most Ghanaians who had to learn French because it was so traumatic because our teachers will beat the hell out of us and Ooh. we were yeah we we're not being introduced to a foreign language if I should put it that way mm-hmm. and they will beat the hell out of us to the point that a lot of Ghanaians even though we're surrounded by francophone countries don't know how to speak French and it's because of the kind of foundation we we, we had with our teachers in school like we were practically scared of the language so yeah and then you're not going to like it that's a very strange approach on it yeah it's a strange and then also even more colonizing than it already is (laughs) i mean as it stands anyway (laughs) at least at least when i was taught english i was taught to love it which is another kind of colonizing yeah (laughs) to the extent (laughs) where you like it more than your own language yeah Um, so now your life and open first of all you're very very open with your your life and your work you share a lot both on Twitter and on your blogs and, of course, the other um, things that you are involved in, virtually connecting and Equity Unbound and all that. How did you discover the world of open? So one of the main things uh, that started it all is being in an environment where there was nobody around me directly to learn from. Not, Mm. Not nobody, but not enough. And so I'm always seeking someone to learn from. And so I was, when I first got the job I have, there was nobody doing instructional technology work in Egypt but me. So I was always seeking things and I found stuff that way. I was on mailing lists and then joining courses and staying in touch with people after courses and in my own master's program, staying in touch like a lot of, not everyone, but a couple of people I stayed in touch, you know, there was that element of it. And then with with the openness that I'm in now, mm. when I was about to finish my PhD, because I, I lived in the US and the UK for short amounts of time while I was there, but when I was finishing it, there started to be around me a few people because we started to have a um, department for education. So I started to see some people like that, but there weren't enough who had done their PhDs in the UK. And I wanted to know like, what's it like to finish the PhD and stuff. And so I discovered like on Facebook, on Twitter, there were communities of people that I could ask and they could answer me and I could get help. So that was one element of how I got into social media. And, um, and I remember I was also started to one of my mentors liked my writing and so encouraged me to start writing like non-peer-reviewed pieces as well. And I liked the element of just expressing my opinion quickly. So Mm -hmm. I found a space for that and realized that social media would help me reach people that way. So at first I was like broadcasting and asking questions. And after a while it became a space to meet people and and get to know them long-term, not for Mm -hmm. a purpose, not because I want something from them. Mm -hmm. I want to just broadcast myself, but because I actually want to get to know them and know what they need and help them with what they want as well as get help when I need it. Uh, So it started like that. Um, And uh, again, I I was actually, when I was finishing my PhD, I was on maternity leave Mm -hmm. because my daughter was still very young and the the country was a bit politically unstable, so I couldn't go out a lot. Um, And so I got the benefit from that is that the social media allowed me, like I could be looking for something and not find it and people would help me find an article. And then what started to happen is there was a point in time when my supervisor wanted me to write a lot of methodology work. The university library was closed because of political unrest. And the online library didn't have everything I needed. And I realized that some people put stuff open access that gave Mm. me what I needed. And I fell in love with open access and openness and piracy, honestly, Mm. because piracy can be socially just (laughs) if knowledge is being prevented from reaching us because we're in this kind of country where we don't have access. So that's where I fell in love with the open access part. But then the way my daughter comes into it is uh, it was difficult to travel for conferences. And as I started to learn a lot 
with these ongoing like connect connectivist MOOCs as well as the regular MOOCs. But the connectivist MOOCs were all about making connections on social media. And I learned that I learned from people. And also I had a very critical perspective on educational technology that was again very rare. And so you had to find your people. You weren't going to find them everywhere. Uh, and so finding them, having conversations with them, blogging across each other and learning about each other. Um, I didn't have confidence to blog until I finished my PhD, actually. And the key thing was in the PhD, you have to write in a formal way. And I liked my non-formal way of writing. And the blog mm. allowed me to do that. And I could just publish whenever I wanted. It was very empowering. Um, and when I had an audience and people started to read me, I was reading them and we would you know, respond to each other. That helped a lot. So when I couldn't go to conferences... Uh, I started to discover where could I do a virtual conference. And I realized that the virtual conference experience is good because I don't have to leave my daughter or I don't have to take her with me, which is expensive. Um, but the interaction wasn't enough. I did interact a little bit on Twitter and people would respond because they knew me, but I wanted more. And so that's where Virtually Connecting came about. I was on the organizing committee of one of the conferences and I was planning to go, but I couldn't in the end for social and logistical and financial reasons. Um, and so one of my friends, Rebecca Hoag, said, oh, well, maybe I can get my phone or my iPad and you can talk to people while you're... I wanted to talk to people. I didn't want to attend the conference sessions. I could do that. That's not mm. a problem. But it's the chatting that you do when you're over coffee or in the hallway. You yeah, know? That's what yeah. I was missing. And I had so many of my friends, the friendships I've been cultivating online for two or three years. I wanted to meet these people and spend time with them. And the thing is, we're like, oh, well, maybe other people want to join us. Maybe not just you. me talk to them. Maybe other people want to. So we'd say, oh, I'm meeting this person. Do you want to come? And it would be someone that a lot of people know and they'd like to meet them. And we just have these informal conversations. You're not meeting for a webinar. You just mm. know, hi, how's the conference going? You know, what's the funny thing that happened today? Yeah. And you just have a conversation. Um, and after that was over, people were like, oh, this is a good idea. Are you going to do it again? I'm going to a conference. Do you want to come to this conference and talk to people? People started volunteering with it. And then it became our thing that, you know, people go to conferences and we became a very big group. And it was not about Rebecca or me anymore. There was a large group of people who, you know, it started as giving access to conferences for virtual folks, but it actually became challenging academic gatekeeping that was preventing voices of Global South and women and early career people and PhD students who didn't have access to funds and single parents who couldn't travel, people with disabilities or health issues that made traveling difficult. Yeah. They now had a voice in the conferences, in the conversations. And so that was that's what Virtually Connecting is and became, grew from um, being about access to mm -hmm. being about disrupting and challenging yeah. injustice, really. Sometimes you could have these critical conversations, even though the conference was doing a very conservative route. And it's interesting because now I'm linking this to just your, your love and your personality to connect, to get to know people, to, to interact. And look at what, what has come out of it. This is so beautiful. It's such a beautiful story. How did Equity Unbound come about? Equity Unbound came about originally because um, I teach a course, as well as my full-time job, I also teach an undergraduate course on digital literacies and intercultural learning. And my students take part in an experience called Solia, which is something that I used to facilitate myself in my early days. And now it's part of my course where other people, my students go and have intercultural dialogue with other students all over the world with a facilitator from Solia. So it's a great intercultural experience, but there's two issues with it. It's not an open experience. And I know from my life that there's a lot of usefulness in intercultural uh, interaction that happens openly. And I wanted my students to sort of experience a little bit of the power of that. It's not the same as being online for five or six years on Twitter, but at least yeah. they experience a little bit of it. And the other thing is, so Leo tries to be equity focused, but I also think there's value in, uh, in having something, a curriculum that's centered on equity focused and open intercultural dialogue. What Equity Unbound is, it's an open, connected, uh, equity focused intercultural uh, curriculum. I developed it with two people that I met online. Mia Zamora and Catherine Cronin. Mia is in the U.S., Catherine is in Ireland. And originally what we did was all of us were teaching. We would gather resources. We decided on certain topics and dates for when we would do things. And we'd do things across our classes so that people could do them together. Mm -hmm. Then we would open it up so that other people in the world could join in. They could join in the Twitter scavenger hunt. They could join in a hypothesis annotation of an article and things like that. And they could see the resources that we were reading and watching in our own classes. Uh, and we would do live sessions with experts and invite students to come and talk. And we'd record and live stream so other people can watch and so on. That's what, how it started. In August 2020, the fourth project of Equity Unbound, which is for me the most valuable one, uh, is a community building resources. We were mm. like, everybody's going to have to teach online next semester, especially people in the Northern Hemisphere. But, you know, still useful for everyone, I think. 
Um, and they don't know how to build community online. And a lot of the online learning before the pandemic was very different. Uh, not everyone did it. It was not synchronous, a lot of it. And they weren't younger people. Most of the time, it was usually graduate students and stuff. So people needed to know how to build community online. And a lot of them were struggling with that, not just in my university, but everywhere. So we decided to use Equity Unbound and to work with 1HE. So one of Equity Unbound, there's a big community of educators. Like originally, we did it for our students, but we realized that it supported us as educators to inspire each other and support each other, you know. Uh, and so the Equity Unbound community building resources that we did on the 1HE site is collection of demos of how do I do an introductory activity that's inclusive? How do I um, have an ongoing conversation that involves all the students? How do I warm up in my class to make sure the students are ready for the class and are interested and so on? So it has demo videos of us doing the thing. So you see what it looks like in practice. Mm -hmm. And there's a description and templates and adaptations. Because for us, one of the central things is intentionally equitable hospitality, which is a concept we developed at Virtually Connecting, which is when you're your teacher, you have power in the classroom and you need to use it to be hospitable. Pulling away as the teacher is just going to introduce power dynamics between the students. It's not about empowering students that you pull away. Right. You need to create an environment that allows for equity and you need to be intentional about it with every single thing that you do. And then you need to check that it's working. So every time we demo an activity, we say, oh, but what if students don't have good internet and can't turn on their camera? What if a student doesn't feel comfortable turning on their camera because their family is behind them? Uh, what if you don't have access to Zoom and breakout rooms? How could you do it? Could you do this asynchronously? Could you do it, um, you know, text-based instead of video-based? We did this throughout, and we always thought about these things. And so when we shared these resources online, we also invited other people to contribute their own. It wasn't just uh, Mia and I. There was also our colleague Autumn, who was a Virtually Connecting co-director at the time, mm. working on these. But we also invited other people to contribute one or two. And so that one was, I think for me, one of the biggest open contributions, the biggest open resource that I've contributed that I think uh, has value to the world. And I'm glad that I didn't do it just for my institution. Mm. You're so passionate about this. Ma, you are very open, open in all aspects. You share your work, you share about your life and all that. How important do you think being open is in this day and age in this world that we live in, you think that there's something great to be said about being open with your work and mm -hmm. adopting an open philosophy? So first of all, I don't think there's anything that is right for everyone, but this is not maybe one of the things that will right thing for everyone. I have a friend just personality wise who felt like every time she tweeted, she feels naked. It took me about a, 10 years to feel confident blogging. I didn't just do it right away. I had a Twitter account from 2008, but I only started using it properly in 2014. It can take time to warm up to these things. You might need to see a lot of examples of how it works. And also it takes time to build up your network so that it gives you dividends. It doesn't yeah. quickly become useful. It's really confusing at first and difficult. And like I'm on Instagram. I don't use Instagram. I still don't know what to do with it. You know, like there's, you know, and you also need to find out where your people are. Because maybe in your field, whatever your field is, maybe people are on Snapchat or maybe people are on TikTok. I don't know where people are, but a lot of my people are on Twitter and that's why it works for me. And that's why I'm there all the time. But if my people were somewhere else, I'd probably go wherever they are, you know, so that's the first thing. Um, and the other thing is uh, one of the advantages of openness is like it crosses these boundaries. If your work is extremely local, sometimes you need to focus your energies on the local. A lot of times the local can learn from the global. Uh, but sometimes the global can be distracting or not relevant. And so depending on what you're doing, if you know you need to make a decision about yourself and your safety and your family, could it harm you? How badly can it harm you? I haven't gotten a huge amount of harm from anything that I've done. I've gotten occasional comments about, you know, just being a Muslim and maybe I'm a terrorist or things like that, but they're very rare. So I think openness can give if you're willing to give it. I think a lot of people may benefit from other people's openness without ever doing anything first and that's okay because a lot of open stuff is there for anyone to use without reciprocity but if you reciprocate and if you maintain relationships and you invest in building them you're going to get so much more out of it because people will find you and get you things you didn't even know you needed because they know you're interested in them you know when someone just tells you oh i saw this thing this project these people get to know these people they're relevant to what you're doing and that's just magical when it happens so Maha, um, how would you describe life in Egypt as a woman and the kind of woman you are, very passionate, very vocal, very, very extroverted? How is, how is that like in Egypt? First of all, it's really important to realize it, uh, women's rights in Egypt has a very long history. And 
my first boss who hired me, her mother was one of the leaders of that movement. And compared to a lot of nearby countries, not all of them, but it's one of the, we have all kinds of issues, but there has been a lot of work on improving family law. It's still not great. We don't always get what we want because it's a patriarchal society and all that, but there's a lot of that going on. So it's not, I wouldn't say like, there's a lot of oppression of women, but there's also a lot of vocality about it so that it's not one of those things that you can't really talk about. Mm. There's also a lot of men who talk the talk of gender equality, but in reality, in their own homes, with their own families, they don't do that. I think being a woman anywhere in the world, your awareness of gender inequality is intuitive. I think I was six or seven when I started noticing it and talking to my mom about it. My child notices it. She says, oh, uh, first of all, why is this photo all men? Or why is the teacher calling on the boys more than she's calling on me? And Mm. so it's, it's really hard not to notice it. So yeah. If you're given the opportunity to, to talk about it, it helps other people talk about it too. I think that's one of the reasons I'm open is that there are things a lot of us are feeling that we don't talk about, but when someone starts talking about it, then it becomes a thing that we can do something about. Yeah. It's not like just me on my own and nobody else. I'm just the only one who has that problem. Thank you very much, Maha. I'm so glad we could do this. And it was so nice talking to you. Like, I really appreciate this. And thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Maha. We hope you keep the connections going. Maha Bali is Associate Professor of Practice at the Center for Learning and Teaching at the American University in Cairo. Thank you for listening to Inspiring Open, a podcast series from Wikilove's Women. This first series of Inspiring Open was funded through the International Relief Fund for Organizations in Culture and Education 2021, an initiative of the German Federal Foreign Office the Gothi Institute and other partners, and an annual grant from the Wikimedia Foundation. If you enjoyed today's show, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Feel free to share, rate, and review us. We appreciate the support. You can also tag us in your posts. We are at Women on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'll leave you with the words of Ndozake Shange. Sisterhood is important because we are all we have to stand on. We have to stand near and by each other, pray for one another, and share the joys and the difficulties that women face in the world today. If we don't talk about it amongst ourselves, then we are made silent by the patriarchy, and that serves us no purpose. Until next time, look after yourselves and your sisters. And remember, be inspired, be challenged, be bold. I am Betty Kankambwedu and you've been listening to Wiki Loves Women, Inspiring Open. Mm-hmm.